Well, here we go. Uh, our first speaker for this session is Mike Cohen. Uh, I don't think he really needs an introduction to this audience. Um, he, uh, on how many magazines were you on the cover of, Mike? <laughs> Not too many. Yeah. Well, everybody knows Mike Cohen from UNC, and uh, he's going to talk to us about treatment as prevention. And just so that you know, he promised he's going to show us some new data that we haven't seen, and he's going to be provocative as always. <laughs> Thank, thanks. Thanks. And thanks. I think uh, let's have a round of applause for Veronica, John, and Ken for really. I think um, <clears throat> having, having been involved with this particular meeting from the very beginning and the first phone call, I think you can be incredibly proud and pleased that it's, it's uh, routinized. So congratulations. It's the you. staff. <laughs> well, it does, the, the sure forum staff me, and I, IHL. I congratulate you. So I'll use slides, not surprisingly. And I saw in the back they're hard to see. I'm going to go very fast and I'll only slow down where something's relevant. So <laughs> don't, if I don't slow down, don't worry, you didn't miss anything. Um, the, I guess the first point I'll make is we, we, we really have on one slide, um, on this one slide, a set of what we are able to do for HIV prevention, and, and I think those are the opportunities available to us. Uh, Dr. Volpe is going to talk in, in really great detail about the general ideas about uh, behavioral interventions. I just want to point out that HIV prevalence has fallen dramatically on this planet. And, and I would argue, and while I'm a big proponent of ART, as we'll get to, I don't believe it's fallen because of ART. I believe it's fallen because of the tremendous work that people have done with condom distribution and all kinds of behavioral change interventions. And the frustration is that we don't have one thing to tell people. And that leads us away from understanding that we have made great progress. Nancy Padian did a great job in 2010 summarizing all the tools and, and, and making this argument. And also bring your attention as one of the leaders of the HIV Prevention Trials Network to a couple of ideas. One is that a study done by Tom Coates, a very large study in Africa called HBTN 043, has some interesting new data. It'll be published in the next few months. And I would really pay attention to that study in terms of behavioral interventions. The other is that one of the, Bernie may, may not still be here, but it's a, the tool we really need is an anti, uh, to, be able, to be able to take a serum sample and test it and prove we're seeing incident infection, cross-sectional incidents. That will revolutionize our ability to understand interventions quicker Oliver Lendecker published a couple of papers this month about new ways of approaching cross-sectional incidents, and it's worth looking at those papers. Dr. Volpe will talk more about behavior change. The other thing that hasn't come up at this meeting, which I would find to be a problem, is vaccines. The vaccine field is making terrific progress, and I just want to summarize in two sentences the progress. One piece of progress is the RB144 trial in which, through tremendous efforts of Bart Haynes and his group, they were able to demonstrate that antibodies were being generated that were antibodies that use cells, ADCC, and they were able to show that the concentration of IgG made by, these, uh, by this vaccine, when it was in a high concentration, it could help prevent HIV. But when IgA antibodies formed, it offset the benefits of IgG. That was an important discovery, and so people are pursuing that right now. The other thing going on in the vaccines field that's moving very fast is neutralizing, broad neutralizing antibodies. And so we now know that there are antibodies generated by people with HIV that can kill all HIV strains. The question is, or almost all HIV, let me not be too hyperbolic, most HIV, <laughs> hyperbole is a problem, uh, most HIV strains. And now the problem is how do we make the host respond to make those antibodies in high enough concentrations in mucosal secretions to prevent HIV infection? But this is moving fast. And so the kind of um, despair at vaccine, the vaccine field is unnecessary. The other thing that came up at this meeting was pre-exposure prophylaxis, a lot. And I think as we talked about pre-exposure prophylaxis, it was not necessarily emphasized that while Truvada is a wonderful addition to Nafavir FTC and approved, it's not the end. It's not the end of the field. And I just want to draw your attention to the things that are moving forward. Um, HPT-069, Ken Mayer and others are working on a trial of Maraviroc, a uh, CCR5 inhibitor. The reason for that is to get away from a drug used routinely in therapeutics so we have an agent not used routinely in therapeutics. 
injectables would help us get away from the problem of adherence. And so on that slide are long-acting injectable agents that are in careful review potentially to be used for pre-exposure prophylaxis and monoclonal antibodies, the same ones we're thinking about that would generate with a the vaccine, they could theoretically be used for prevention. Of course, we've done that in the hepatitis field, used monoclonal or, uh, antibodies for prevention. So I think one should pay attention to the next PrEP or next generation of PrEP. What I'm asked to talk about is, is treatment as prevention or using ART for prevention, the thing we worked on very hard. Um, and I'll summarize and try not to be too redundant and tell you new things in that area. The first issue is what were we always concerned about? We were concerned about can ART prevent HIV transmission? Now, while we were trying to design a study, we were told everybody knows that. I'll put that in quotes. Everybody knows that. But that wasn't really the question. The real question is what's the magnitude of prevention and what's the durability of prevention? The reason we did the study was to offer a magnitude number. I would argue with you that the current movement towards treatment as prevention, which is so strong right now, would be totally different if, if the study we had done had found 5 percent prevention. The other point is we need to see the durability. And we're still, the study I'll talk about is ongoing because we have to know the durability of the benefit. We're also concerned about the exact message to tell infected people worldwide. And then there's the issue of can treatment as prevention serve as a public health benefit, serve the public health benefit. I'm going to tell you the yes of it and the no of it before I stop. The study we did HPD 1052 randomized groups to two arms. There was an immediate arm at the CD4 count 350 to 550, and there's a delayed arm where therapy was offered between 200 and 250. The median in the immediate arm of treatment was 446. The median in the delayed arm was 225. So we were very careful about trying to prevent people in the delayed arm from slipping. The endpoints, couples were enrolled. The index case was infected. The partner was not infected, both men and women. And the endpoint, the primary endpoint of the study was linked transmissions using tools of molecular virology, in part developed for this study by Sue Eshelman and others. Um, and another endpoint was to see whether early treatment is better. This is the first randomized trial that actually looks carefully at early treatment. Um, and the actual details of this trial will be published later this year, as I'll, sh I'll show you in a second. Now, to do this ethically, of course, we said don't have sex, don't have sex, don't have sex, and especially only have sex with your primary partner. Use condoms, use condoms, use condoms, use condoms. Now, this self-reported condom thing deserves just a moment of attention. In our study, 95 or 96 percent of the people said they use condoms every single episode of intercourse. And that was great, except there were 248 pregnancies. So, <laughs> so given that there were 248 pregnancies, either there was a miracle of unbelievable Christmas importance. Um, <laughs> You know, so this study could be twisted around and said, whoa, we really need to think about this. Or it means that self-reported behavior has to be looked at with some concern. The study took a long time to do, which was a source of tremendous criticism. We worked on this for more than 10 years. We fully enrolled the study around 2010. And um, the study is going to run. The study is ongoing. I'll say that 25 times. This is an ongoing study. It will potentially end in 2015. And I say the word potentially for a reason I'll get to in a second. We enrolled 278 couples in America and 954 in Africa. We oversampled Africa as the epicenter of the epidemic and 531 in Asia. As all of you know, on April 28th of 2011, only 18 or 20 months into the study, we were asked to make the results public. We were never asked to stop the study or modify the study. We were asked to make the results public. We were asked to make the results public because over those two years, the DSMB observed two things. There were 11 unlinked transmissions. As much counseling as we did, people had sex with somebody outside their primary partnership. There was only one linked transmission in that study, and that led to a 96 percent prevention. And they felt that that was important enough to inter not interrupt the study to make the interim results public. Now, the clinical part of the study has only in part been presented. It's clear from that slide, it may be a little hard to read, that the early treatment delays bad things happening to subjects. So at 446, when you start the treatment and you let a donut hole down to 250, you see much in the 250 group, you see much more tuberculosis and more WHO stage 4 events. This year we'll report the following. Other bad things happen to the quality of life. The people who are in the delayed arm have much more zoster, much more candidiasis, and more skin problems in general. Now, those may seem like trivial things, 
but for the person who's suffering those problems, they matter. And our conclusion was that earlier treatment is better than late treatment. But again, this is only the benefits seen after two years, a little more than two years. The full benefits won't be realized till a five-year period goes by. Ethically, so now we had our last DSMB meeting November 9, 2012. That was last week. At that meeting, it was agreed this study will continue for a minimum until 2015. Why are we continuing? Because we need to see the durability of prevention, even though we've rolled everyone who's willing onto ART. There's no delayed group anymore. As soon as we saw the result, results, we, everyone was asked to take ART. On every visit, they're asked to take ART. But we need to see, even then, the durability of ART. Does it prevent acquisition of HIV? We need to follow adverse events of early treatment, because maybe there are adverse events we don't anticipate. And we're most concerned about the delayed arm. In the delayed arm of 1,000 people, roughly, that were delayed, will they end up having problems? And can those problems be seen over five years? And this is why I'm a little concerned. It's possible that the delayed arm of the study will be followed for a very long period of time. My friend Rochelle Walensky is shaking her head yes, because we anticipate in order to see whether strokes and heart disease and other problems are necessary, this cohort may be the best cohort in Africa for 20 years to see what happens. Now, don't tell the NIH I said that, okay, under any circumstances. Henry, don't explain that I'm thinking of a 20-year study, okay? <laughs> he sees Dr. Fauci all the time, and that'll be the end of my career. Um, now, let me say that 96 percent of the patients have been retained in the study, that 93 percent are taking ART, that 85 percent of the index cases have the same partners. This slide is meant to be uninterpretable, so don't, don't even, this is not meant for consumption by anybody in this room. It's only meant, maybe Dave, Dave, you, I want you to, you're going to report on this. This is a molecular virology slide essentially t saying something that when we see a transmission event in 052 with the tools of molecular virology that are now available to us, we can tell when the virus was transmitted with pretty good accuracy. So we've had a couple of transmission. The one is the most important. And we can take that one transmission event and using a bunch of different tools that are kind of shown on this uninterpretable slide, we can say that that virus was transmitted most likely on the day the index patient started therapy. What's the point there? If you're going to use ART for prevention, it's not the first day. Several weeks must go by, so virus can be suppressed, and so on and so forth. And I apologize for this slide will be published someday, and someone will read it somewhere, someplace. Um, now, Rochelle Walensky is in the audience and has been a popular figure at this meeting. Um, she has submitted, will submit a paper this week about the cost-benefit analysis of 052. We thought this was extremely important because we have all the data to look at the treatment benefits and the prevention benefits in one group. And what Rochelle will report, and she can leap to her feet if I've said anything wrong on this slide, she'll report that in our analysis of 052 in South Africa, that over the short term, you actually save money, not just cost effectiveness, but save money by starting immediate therapy, as we call immediate therapy. Now, she looked at India and South Africa over longer time frames, and she argues that, that using her language of cost effective and very cost effective, that if you do ART with the immediate arm, 350 to 500, it's very cost effective over the range of the, of the time. So this gets at the when to start ART question, which I will come back to. But my point is Rochelle and her group, which are very, um, I think, well recognized for their conservative and cautious look at this, I think it's safe for me to put words in her mouth, which I will do, and say, either you pay now or you pay later. And if you pay now, you pay less. And this is a big way of thinking about what we ought to be doing. Now, the health economists writ large beyond what Rochelle does are looking at the GDP. And they're saying if you take a country that has a big HIV epidemic and you treat people earlier, what happens to the GDP? And on this slide from my, car my colleague Harsha Thermanathi, he shows that if you start people and their CD4 is above 500, the GDP goes up in South Africa. So the argument's not just for personal health or for transmission, it's for the wealth of the country. So as we debate when to start therapy, sooner or later we have to look at all this data and come to a conclusion. If you're really interested in all the public health policies that stem from 052, they're summarized in one article in a special issue of Health Affairs. I took the narcissistic view of just putting the article on a slide, but the article has every, all the policy changes that occurred are summarized in the special issue of Health Affairs in this particular article published a, a few months ago. Um, I was told by Veronica that I absolutely had to say something about hepatitis C. This is probably stolen from somebody in the, whose slide is this? Raise your hand. This is certainly not my slide. I'll say it's Dave Thomas' slide. 
I, I promise this is stolen, okay, let me, and I don't even know who I stole it from. However, having admitted that, <laughs> it's probably the CDC slide, uh, the point that's been made at this meeting over and over again is that hepatitis C can be approached in a whole new way thanks to the genius of a lot of people in this room, that there are treatments that are going to work, and that at the present time we're at the very beginning with 6% of the people being treated, or a very small number treated. So this is the future. And I also very much, uh, representing the PTN officially, we very much embrace the idea of trying to look for opportunities for synergy where we're looking at HIV prevention to look at hepatitis C prevention. And, I, and, and we, will, we will really aggressively pursue that in the next five years. The ACTG, another network, at, has been officially charged to work on HIV, heps, uh, uh, HIV, hepatitis C, and tuberculosis. But we embrace the idea of prevention for hep C. So now we get to the end of my 20 minutes, and we get to the, what I would view as hyperbole. So we published the 052 results, and we had two years of experience, and we said that we saw 96% prevention, and we were thrilled by that because we had answered at least a little part of our question, what was the magnitude of prevention? But that was taken, I believe, a little bit out of context because we never claimed we were going to end the AIDS epidemic. And, but the economists decided this was the end of AIDS. And obviously, we like catalytic forward movement. But now I have to, and, and, and while I am very optimistic, as you'll hear, I want to raise the notes of caution and what we need to work on. And there are four things we need to be cautious about, and they're on this slide. The when to start question, acute infection, which we haven't talked enough about at this meeting, the cascade, which we've talked about endlessly at this meeting, and I'll show yet one more stolen cascade slide, and, um, and messages from ecological studies. The when to start question. Remember that in the United States, we've agreed. We're done. We've said that we believe the benefits are so great of immediate therapy that people who are detected should be linked to care and started on treatment. That's fantastic, and I think that the I, I cannot be more happy that with the U.S. conclusion. But remember, this is not the worldwide conclusion. The Europeans are very resistant to anything before 350, and WHO is meeting this week to make their own decision. And in the absence of WHO embracing immediate therapy, the world epidemic is not going to be affected. And to the extent that people hear mixed messages, they're never going to fix the cascade. Because even if you're a physician living in the United States or an American patient, you're going to say, well, the Europeans don't get treated. Why do I need to be treated? So this dichotomy is a huge problem. So on this slide it are the issues. We believe, and I'll speak for all Americans right now, we believe, <laughs> I believe that's my privilege, um, <laughs> well, I believe I'll, I'll be, that the consequences of replication are very well studied, and it's not good to have ongoing replication. And if I ask the ID people in the room to raise your hand who's waiting till they're 350 if they're positive, very few people are going to raise their hand. The replication we don't believe is healthy for you. There's reduced long-term survival, and this is going to come out this year, that a lot of people are studying long-term survival in a lot of ways, and they're saying, you lose years of your life if you delay therapy. And, and that's an important, it may not be, seem important when you're 25, but when you're 65, you start thinking, why didn't I start my therapy when I was 25? And then the ongoing risk of transmission has to be really paid attention to or not, because there's no one arguing but that will reduce transmission at some level for people who are suppressed. And then Rochelle's paper, I think, the cost-benefit analysis, will be a very powerful argument that this is quite definitive proof that you pay now and you save money later. So what arguments are against starting people immediately? Well, first of all, the Europeans believe that there's some harm that's going to be, uh, some harm that we haven't yet observed. And we know there's, quote, harm if you look at toxicities of drugs and the possibility you'll lose your first-line regimen, but they believe that maybe they'll see some other harm that's never been observed with the antiviral therapies. They also are searching for benefit, and that search for benefit is a really big problem because when you start people at high CD4 counts and delay only to 350 and you're looking for benefit, you're going to be looking not for five years, but 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. So if we're going to wait for, in my opinion, and this gets controversial, if we're going to wait, we're going to wait a long time to see a difference between 350 and 550. And during those 30 years while we're waiting, we're going to have a lot of transmission events that could have been averted because we're waiting. Now, the last thing is a mixing of medicine and fear. The medicine part to me is very clear, but then people always want to throw in the logistical challenges. What we can't do, it's too expensive, it's the treatment mortgage, the society can't afford it. This is the argument that's most powerfully used as you delay treatment. So I believe the people in this room, I'm not going to speak for all Americans, you have to make a decision. Are, are we at the place where the U.S. is of starting immediately, or are we going to keep messing with this forever and ever, and what's the cost of messing it with forever and ever? And I'll leave that as a debate. Acute infection. This is a slide that many of us have used over and over, and during ramp-up viremia, integration occurs of the virus, making the virus incurable. All compartments are, are infected with HIV, 
and the viral load becomes very high. During this window of time, a lot of transmission occurs. And this is really important in the United States. So now I'm going to slow down. I'm going to slow down so slow, it'll be like a, a North Carolina rate of speed. Um, and I apologize. I'm capable of that. Um, so if we look at molecular phylogeny and transmission events, when we look at the epidemic writ large, we can say that acute infection, the people with the earliest phases of infection, they're responsible for anywhere from 5 to 10 to 30 percent of transmission events. But when we look at communities of gay men, we start seeing clusters. And in England, this is very well documented, where they have an epidemic that's mostly MSM, and they can see, and Martin Fisher has done a very good job with Dean and Pillay showing <coughs> that acute infection is probably playing a very large role. Why is this especially even more important? In England, in the MSM epidemic, they've treated maybe 80 percent of the men who know, are known to be gay men, but they're still having a rising incidence in the population. And this is raising the fear that even if we try and treat our way out of the epidemic, if we don't deal with acute infection aggressively and properly, we may not realize the benefits we're expecting. And so you can anticipate the use of molecular virology a lot and a lot of attention to this, and I think for the U.S. this is really important. So I don't think we should oversell treatment as prevention without dealing with acute infection. This is a Greg Millett slide yesterday, just getting back to the cascade, and everyone recognizes that if you're going to treat your way out of the epidemic, you need to deal with the 100 percent suppression, and that, that effort is even more challenged in black men in the United States as emphasized in the slide. So if we're going to use treatment as prevention, not only do we have the acute infection problem, we have the cascade problem, and that, that needs to be addressed. Wafel Sader, Sally Hodder, and others are doing what I think is a terrifically important study, kind of biting the bullet and saying, we're going to look in New York and Washington, link people to care, create an environment where people are suppressed, and use behavioral economics to some extent to try and demonstrate that that can help suppress, and, and maybe uh, Dr. Volpe will talk about this. So let me show you what I think is going to be published in the next few weeks that's the most important glimmer of hope, a really important study from Africa. So this is by Frank Tanzer and Mary Louise Newell from the Africa Center. Almost 15 years ago, they started studying the release of ART across Kuwuzu Natal. The green is no ART. The darker and darker orange are communities, communities that have more than 40 percent of the people who need ART are getting ART. So you see a big dis disparity. Then they enrolled 16,000 people who are HIV negative into a cohort. And they followed the 16,000 people for 10 years. And they looked at zero conversion, and they had all the home addresses. And what they found is, if you lived in a community where more than 40 percent of the people were getting ART, for every 1 percent increase in ART in the community, there's greater than a 1 percent fall in incidence, real incidence, real zero conversion of HIV. In communities with greater than 40 percent ART, there's a 50 percent fall in incident HIV. This is an ecological study. It has all the criticisms of ecological study. Maybe those communities had sex differently. Maybe those communities were offered condoms three times a day. Who knows? But they, they did a lot of analysis and a lot of sensitivity analysis, and it's a very compelling paper to be published in a very important journal. I believe it will get a lot of attention. And what it says is that treatment can work as prevention. That's the first point. It says that even though you're not dealing with acute infection, you still get this tremendous benefit. So it's a really exciting piece of work by Tanzer and Newell and others, uh, Tilling, uh, Tillinghouse, so uh, if I said his name? Barninghouse. Barninghouse. Uh, Till Barninghouse. Thank you. Uh, so th that group has done a terrific job, and it's a really important piece of work. <clears throat> In order to follow up on this work and solidify it, OGAC, PEPFAR, um, CDC and NIH are partnered in three giant studies. One's called CDC Botswana, one's called HPTN071, one's called USAJHU Tanzania. These are studies designed to introduce everything we know how to do in combination, circumcision, counseling, and in some communities, the 052 approach, treat people immediately, trying to show that if you do everything you know how to do in four years, you will see those communities have falling incidents at an unexpected uh, rate. So it's a pretty exciting time for this kind of prevention research, and these studies are all just getting into the field. So I want to end, and I hope I've done just about 20 minutes, I hope. Um, I want to, I, I want to, how, am I short, am I too much time or too little time? Oh, there's no timer. You'll be glad. This, may I, let's take a break and I'll show my next hour of slides. <laughs> may I have my next hour? <laughs> um, so, so the, the point is, I believe 
where we are right now is a really important point in this epidemic for a couple of reasons. The, the politicians who normally are kind of arguing with you, don't pay attention, don't pay attention, the Obama administration has created an expression for us, the AIDS-free generation. They've said what this group has done has led them to believe that if the tools are applied, that we will have a different future. It's kind of amazing, because usually we're arguing with the politicians, they're telling us to do more, and I find that quite inspiring and amazing. But we're at this bridging point, and here's the point. It's not like, it's 34 million people need treatment. Just bite the bullet. All those people need treatment. Now, the WHO is committed to 15 million by 2015, but it's really 34 million, and it can't be 2034. It's 34 million by 2016. I'm being hyperbolic, but you know, that's the goal. Why do we want to treat 34 million people? Because they all need it for their own health, and they all need it to prevent transmission, whether it's perfect or imperfect. So, but if you try and talk about mass treatment, it just freaks people out. And they immediately freak out and they say it's the treatment mortgage and we don't have enough people to treat eye disease or heart disease and so on and so forth. And I understand that. But that also is rooted in too concrete thinking. There needs to be wishful thinking, magical thinking, and aspirational thinking. The aspirational thinking is clear. It's we're going to treat 34 million people one way or the other eventually or people will die. But the, the real issue is we need to see this as a bridge. In 85, everyone died of HIV. In 95, we had AZT. And by the way, many of us, and John and I certainly took care of patients in 85 where it was uniformly and can. This was a uniformly fatal disease. In, two, in 95, we had AZT, which was unbelievable when people started surviving. In 2005, there's 30 drugs, and we're no longer so worried about this. It's, it's a chronic disease, and we're worried about very different chronic disease issues. This isn't going to be the same in 2020. There's going to be simpler modified therapy. There's no way we're going to even be using one pill a day. It's going to be something different than we're doing now. The cure meeting is going on right now. So if you go just five blocks, there's 100 people in a room talking about curing HIV infection. That didn't exist five years ago. And IH has invested almost $100 million in the group that's meeting to talk about curing HIV who are making rapid progress. <clears throat> Next week, the vaccine group is meeting. They're making rapid, rapid progress. So you need some magical thinking in order to treat the 34 million people. It's aspirational, but I do believe that's the future. And so in the end of the day, we have all the things on this slide now. We have counseling, which clearly works, circumcision, which clearly works, treatment as prevention, which clearly works, topical prep, which clearly is going to work at some level. All these things combined, and no one is doing trials anymore of each of these individual things. We are really obligated and inspired to do trials of combination integrated prevention. It is assumed that that will lead towards an AIDS-free generation. And I think that is a reason, tomorrow's, you know, the White House and PEPFAR will announce their plan and all of it will include the things on this slide. And so I think for those of you who've worked in this forever, congratulations for all this hard work. It is a time when I think it's reasonable to be looking forward to a different reality. So thank you for listening. Thank you.